hellish, just hellish. The shock of processing what my eyes were witnessing caused me to momentarily freeze in disbelief. I was standing at the front door of my home, looking only 200 feet away at our enormous and stately academic hall and witnessing its utter destruction. I had been resting in my study a few minutes before when suddenly I heard the sound of shouting and clanging bells quickly followed by a fierce pounding on my front door. I ran downstairs to find one of the students, frightened, out of breath, and shouting, Mr. President, the hall is on fire! Immediately, I, I could see it all right over his shoulder. Already, flames were licking at the downstairs windows of the building. Thirty minutes later, the entire building would be awash in orange and red against the black sky and dissolving into a lawn of deep white snow. The fire literally roared with a sound not unlike that of a racing train. My heart sank into the pit of my stomach. I was 38 years old, had been president of the University of Missouri for only six months, and I knew at that moment things would be entirely different. The students faculty and staff who were first on hand were magnificent in their reaction. They saved countless papers, furnishings, collections from the museum, including the elephant. The, the second store library floor collapsed into the chapel below, right after a chandelier crashed to the same floor. But countless books were saved. But the, the water in the basement cistern and in the pond just south of the building was not nearly enough to even slow down the Ferno's pace. More fear and excitement ensued when inevitably the ammunition supply of the cadet corps exploded. My own house, now known as the Chancellor's House, which is still located on the quadrangle today, several times was nearly a victim of the same fire were it not for the students who stood on the roof with buckets of water. The next day, the student body, the faculty, and all the leading townspeople met in the Opera House downtown. Governor Francis arrived to speak and to assure everyone of his support and that he would call the legislature into special session. For my part, I told those gathered that indeed we had lost only a building, that the real university was all of them and the real university was untouched. I was born in Virginia, in the same house where George Washington's mother was born. I graduated from the University of Virginia, and then taught math, Greek, Latin, French, and other subjects at several colleges, until the University of Missouri wrote to me at Tulane University and offered me the honor of being its eighth president. In the year after the Great Fire, I and many others didn't merely act defensively to those who wished to see the university move to Clinton or Sedalia, but rather we went on the offense. As a result, six new buildings were built on the campus. The Law Building, Pickard Hall, Swallow Hall, the East Engineering Building, the Fair Hall, and the Power Plant. In the years that followed, I worked with many others to create the university's first summer school, its first graduate programs, its first intercollegiate athletic programs, and the world's first school of journalism. I also felt it critically important that we replace the centuries-old practice of prescribing a more classical course of study with the modern elective system. In my 17 years as university president, I'm proud to say that we quadrupled the size of the faculty and we increased the university's income from $85,000 to $1 million. We also thought it was necessary to increase the standard of admission 
and we did. This in turn created an increase of educational standards in high schools all over Missouri. Something else became important to me in the 1890s. When I arrived at the university, I found a series of rules in place for the student body that were really more, import, more appropriate for a college in Europe in the 17th century. Chapel and church attendance was required, and demerits were issued for sm smoking, drinking, and the use of profanity. Administrators were thought of as surrogate parents. Hmm. Well, I eliminated those harsh rules and set about a purposeful change to a freer, more secular campus. Come to think of it, perhaps that's why it's said of me that I was so popular with the students. <laughs> Leave parenting to parents and religion to the churches. But it wasn't all work. I have many fond memories of family and friends. On the occasion of Mark Twain's visit to the university to give the commencement address in 1902, we hosted him in our home and I was delighted to watch him read bedtime stories to our children. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I'm also very fond of reminiscing about the time that we departed by train for a long overdue vacation in Europe. When the students found out about it, dozens of the fraternity men showed up at my front door that morning and kindly unharnessed the horses from the carriage and pulled it to the train station themselves. Others carried our trunks, and they all gave us the most heartfelt and wonderful send-off as we pulled away from the station. You see, we hadn't vacationed in years, and their thoughtfulness overwhelmed Addie and me. Not too many university presidents can boast about that. <laughs> Still brings a tear of joy to my eye when I think of it. Well, before I bid you adieu, I do want to tell you how proud I am still of my six children. The youngest became a professor of French at MU for over 40 years, and still another secretly worked on the Manhattan Project at the University of Chicago in the 1940s. I do love our university. Ladies and gentlemen, won't you take care of our dear old varsity? Thank you, and adieu.